Hey guys, welcome to my channel where I review books and possibly some other things if I feel like it. I probably will feel like it because winter is coming. But winter is coming. <laughs> here is the books. Here are here are the books that I have read in 2020 thus far and I have loved. They might have changed my life a little bit. So let's get right into it. And of course, I promise you a fun fact at the end of the video. As with all videos, from now on. First book, Trevor Noah. I love Trevor Noah's Daily Show. I am a fan of his. But I guess I can't really say that I'm a fan because I didn't even know that he'd written a book until this year, guys. And this was published in 2016, so as always, I'm late to the game. But I really loved it in his characteristic, what funny, smart, intelligent way. He's just really good at telling stories. And let me say, after reading this book, I am a fan of Trevor Noah's mom. Like, what a woman. If you want to know why, if you want to become a Trevor Noah's mom's fan, then read this book and let me know what you think. I am ashamed to say that I didn't know much about apartheid before reading this book, but this book really made me look into it more, understand sort of a little, a little bit about that part of the world. All right, next. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And this tiny little book, it is tiny, tiny, like compared to this tiny. A Feminist Manifesto in 15 Suggestions. So she says things like, teach her to reject likability. Her job is not to make herself likable. Her job is to be her full self, a self that is honest and aware of the equal humanity of other people. But I think she has a really great voice, very gentle and persuasive and conversational, which is really nice. So very quick read and just hit on so many things that made me think a little harder. What is the premise of this belief? So that's always good. So the next book I read, Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong. I'm glad I read it together with Chimamanda's book because I think while Chimamanda had a very gentle voice in minor feelings, Kathy Park Hong's is a little aggressive, which is not a bad thing, but it was an interesting contrast to read both at the same time. I usually write out quotes. I like to type them out because since I want to be a writer, I want to feel how the writing itself feels. Is that weird? Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> okay. Patiently educating a clueless white person about race is draining. It takes all your powers of persuasion because it's more than a chat about race. It's ontological. It's like explaining to a person why you exist or why you feel pain or why your reality is distinct from their reality. Except it's even trickier than that because the person has all of Western history, politics, literature, and mass culture on their side proving that you don't exist. But as suspicious as I am, I also hope that we can seize this opportunity and change American literature completely, overhaul the tired ethnic narratives that have automated our identities, that have made our lives palatable to a white audience, but remove them from our own lived realities, and stop spelling ourselves out in the alphabet given to us. So I thought things like that, I really loved it, but I think the effect it had on me was more that I became angry and tired, which is not a great feeling to have, um, but I'm glad she did write it. It does speak to a lot of experiences that Asian Americans experience, and of course she doesn't speak for all Asian Americans. And I thought it was really well done and well written um, and very informative. Yeah, but I would say I think you need to be in a good place to read it. Um, some parts are a little hard to read, but whatever works for you. And I also read Healing Racial Trauma by Sheila Wise Rowe. And I really enjoyed this one. I also read Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, but I read the remix version. And while Stamped gave me sort of a good, broad, sweeping 
overview of some of the historical things basically was racist and especially as we see it in the states um, I think reading healing racial trauma was better for me because it helped me to know what I can do to advocate what I can do to create spaces for dialogue and so I think healing racial trauma I read that with several other people from my church I think really grew me in my compassion I learned a lot and if you want to understand a little more just a little more especially during this time and to dig a little deeper into some of the experiences that people have so I think that wraps it up the fun fact for today is did you know that there is such a thing as a cow and bison hybrid. And guess what they're called? Beefalo. <laughs> you can apparently get this beefalo in 21 states, but I tried clicking on the link and it said that the website was not found. So this might be fake news. It might not exist, but be on the lookout, people, for the beefalo. Or not, I guess, if you're vegetarian. I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to cut out, <laughs> trying to cut down on my meat consumption, but I think I would try a beefalo just to say that I tried it. Wait, is the bison and buffalo? Gotta look this up. <laughs> so, according to Britannica, Contrary to the song Home on the Range, buffalo do not roam in the American West. Instead, they are indigenous to South Asia, the water buffalo, and Africa, the Cape buffalo, while bison are found in North America and parts of Europe. Bison are the hipsters of the two animals sporting thick beards. Buffalo are beardless. And then we also have the fact that bison have large humps at their shoulders and bigger heads than buffalo. Buffalo tend to have large horns with very pronounced arcs. Some have reached more than six feet or one point meter meters in length. Wow, amazing. The horns of bison, however, are much shorter and very sharp. All right, whoever named this the beefalo, but it's actually a cow-bison hybrid, you're wrong. It's not a beefalo, it's a, a beeson. Beefson. Bye. <laughs> yep. 